Well, folks, here today I spent $77,000 on a stock in a matter of minutes. And um, even for me, that it's an absolutely, um, you know, pretty insane move to spend on one stock in one day. It's not uncommon to see me spend $5,000, $10,000, even $15,000 on a stock in a day. But, um, you know, $77,000 is a whole different level. And so uh, I want to tell you a little bit about why I invested so heavily in this stock here today. Okay. And I want to take you back for a moment. Moment. By the way, I hope you guys enjoyed today's video as always. Also, make sure you check out that Moomoo deal that will be pinned comment before that ends. They're celebrating their 10th anniversary, and uh, basically you can get up to 15 free stocks valued up to $2,000 with the pinned comment down there. So, you know, going back to when I got in the market at the very end of 08 and into the beginning of 2009, I was in a process of, of learning how this stuff works and, and how stocks work and things like that. And I was very much of the belief that Wall Street knew what they were doing, like Wall Street was smart and things like that, right? Because when you haven't been in the stock market, like you just of the, the thought process of like, hey, they know what they're doing, they're smart, all these sorts of things, right? And this was kind of like, I, I watched a, a, a you know great movie kind of in the days of me getting in the stock market, right? And uh, it was called Wall Street. It's a great movie, phenomenal movie, still probably my favorite finance or stock market related vi uh, movie ever. Um, definitely up there with with Margin Call, right? And there's this individual in the movie called Gordon Gecko, and he's this uh, you know just this guy that like knows everything, just so smart and the way things are portrayed in, in that movie is like Wall Street is really smart and a lot of these guys are, are very successful and things like that, right? And uh, they, they have a ton of money and they know what they're doing. And so that was kind of my thought process going into this, right? And then over time, as I started to dig in, I started to watch CNBC because that was the only uh, finance-related outlet that my parents had back in those days. I was obviously living with my parents back in, you know, 2009. And so, you know, this was prior to YouTube finance and all those sorts of things. And so the, the one place I could kind of go to watch stock market-related content was CNBC. So I started watching a good amount of CNBC over time, and specifically uh, one gentleman named Jim Cramer. And he had a show called Mad Money, which he still runs to this day. And on the show Mad Money, I would watch this, and um, I, I learned a lot from him. But what I noticed as I watched him over time is I noticed that he would what I call flip-flop. So essentially, he would be very bullish on a stock, and then the stock would go down a bunch, and then all of a sudden, he would be magically super bearish on the stock. And the vice versa situation would, would happen where he would be you know, not talking positively about stock. He would do well, and then he would jump on the bandwagon. And I came from the sports world, where in the sports world, you know, prior to the stock market, so in the sports world, I got very used to watching ESPN and the talk shows and whatnot, and I would notice a lot of people would flip-flop, and they'd be, you know, if a team was winning, everybody would be all over that team, and they would be what's called bandwagon fans. And then if that team was doing bad, you know, people was like, I didn't think that team was going to be good. I never said they were going to be good. And they all jump off, okay? And so what I noticed is I'm like, oh, my gosh, this, this gentleman, he's, 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 he's doing what people do in the sports world all the time, hopping on bandwagons, hopping off the bandwagon, and kind of flip-flopping all over the place. And so I was like, man, you know, I, I like him. I'm learning stuff from him. But it just doesn't seem like maybe, maybe he really, you know, has this thing down. And so I was like, well, maybe – it's other Wall Street people. And so what I started to watch is just more CNBC. And I would listen to these analysts go on, you know, in, in those days and talk about stocks. And what I would notice is many times these analysts that are on Wall Street, they start, they're just kind of like going with the flow. And a lot of times they don't really know. They're trying to make these predictions and things like that. But a lot of times it's very backwards looking. They're, they're not looking to the future. And then I kind of started digging into what an analyst does and how much money they make and how they're incentivized um, to do certain things or say certain things. And I started to go down that rabbit hole and I realized, oh man, you know, I, I don't know if these analysts really are, are all cracked up to what I thought they might be when I was first getting in the, the market. So I just started to get very, very confused. And I'm like, okay, like, like, like who, who really knows what, what's going on and who knows these things, right? Then I started to go down the rabbit hole of like fund managers. And I found out a shocking thing that m the high majority of fund managers can't even beat the, the market indexes. Like 80% plus these guys are falling behind the, the major indexes time and time again. And so I'm like, 
I started getting very confused, and I'm like, wait a minute. You know, I watch this Kramer guy, and, and he's all over the place. I'm watching these Wall Street analysts. They're consistently wrong. I'm watching, you know, these, these fund managers that, you know, have these enormous net worths, and they can't even beat the market and things like that. And so I just started getting very confused on, like, who's really successful in this and who's not, right? Because it, what it started to look like to me is it started reminding me much of the sports world where you have certain individuals, you have a lot of people that say play as a quarterback position, but you have certain individuals that are just at such a higher level than everybody else, right? And you've got the rest of quarterbacks that like, you know, can't make it out of like high school or the college ranks and you've got a certain amount that make it to the NFL. But then you have these certain like superstars of the NFL that are just so much better than like everybody else that they kind of like dwarf everybody else, right? So then I started to say, okay, who are like the superstars of this, right? Who are the people that are actually tearing up? They don't just play quarterback, but they're on a whole different level, right? And that's where I started to find people like Warren Buffett and found that, you know, his returns over time were absolutely amazing. And this was a gentleman that just did absolutely phenomenal. And then I started being able to watch some interviews that they would do on CNBC with him. And then I started to find some YouTube clips over time when I was in college in 2009 and whatnot, 2010, and started watching and being like, oh my gosh, this guy actually speaks. And when he speaks it makes sense and he gets these incredible returns i found a guy named peter lynch and peter lynch just is a gentleman that got this um, unbelievable returns for a very long amount of time in the market right and i started to know some mass massive differences i started to notice between these folks like a warren buffett and peter lynch and what much of wall street is essentially and here's what i noticed okay and this is very important Take a moment to tell you about Moomoo here today. Moomoo is one of the fastest growing trading platforms out there that is commission free. Listen to this through my pinned comment down there. If you just set up an account with them, you get a free stock. If you deposit a hundred dollars or more, you get five free stocks. And if you deposit $2,000 or more, you get 15 free stocks. Yes, you heard me right. Up to 15 free stocks, which is absolutely amazing. And think about the sort of market we're in right now. It's a very down market. If you're going to get free stocks, this is a pretty good market to get free stocks versus one that's high flying. Moomoo is a commission-free trading platform for stocks, ETFs, options, ADRs, and OTC. It's owned by Futu, which is a NASDAQ-listed fintech company. It has up to 18 million users with SIPC insurance protection. It's safe and secure. They also use AI-powered insights, pro trade tools. You can also get free real time level two market data, which is pretty darn amazing. Moomoo also has a feature, which is earnings calendar, which is very helpful for the next month because you know there's about to be a lot, and I mean a lot of earnings coming. Investors on Moomoo absolutely love the platform as well. It's a 4.6 out of five stars on the iOS app store. So make sure you click that pinned comment down there, guys. It will also be the first link in the description. Set up an account with them, get your free stocks, and enjoy the Moomoo platform. It is pretty darn awesome. The Wall Street folks were very caught up in the short-term stock price movements of companies and what's going on for the next quarter for a company and the next six months for a company. Whereas folks like Buffett and Lynch, what they talked about is a long-term for these companies. They were talking about the next three years, five years, seven years, 10 years for a company. So there was so much of a different like what they're actually focused on. Wall Street, what I noticed is they consistently focused on outward indicators. So meaning like go with the flow, like how are things trading right now, technical data. They're looking kind of outward. What's the, the sentiment around the stock? What's other folks on Wall Street's opinions? Versus Buffett and Lynch, what they looked at is they looked at their inward focus. They looked at how to value these companies, why these companies are going to succeed, but based upon what their beliefs were not based upon what the consensus beliefs are, not based upon the sentiment for that given month, that given day, that given week for a stock. They're looking inside themselves for this data. And then judging companies by looking at things like the annual report, the 10K, the 10Q, by listening to conference calls, things like that, and not really caring about what anybody else's opinion is. Not caring about all that, okay? The Wall Street folks, time and time again, I watch these folks and they would tell you to sell stocks when the stock's already down massively, which was very counterintuitive to folks like Buffett and Lynch because what Buffett and Lynch are going to tell you is if you really believe in a company, you've researched it well, you understand why it's going to grow in the future and why its net incomes are growing to certain numbers and margins and all sorts of things, you need to buy the dips. It doesn't matter if the stock's down 20, 30, 40, 50, 60%. 
the more it's discounted, the more it's giving you a great opportunity to buy more shares of stock at very depressed values, right? So it was a very different philosophy there. Wall Street folks would say things like, buy what works. So buy whatever's working in the market. So whatever stocks are going up at that particular time, buy those stocks because those are the ones that are doing good. Buffett and Lynch look at that and like, what? What are we talking about here? No, no, you're not just going to buy a stock because it's going up. Like, that's ridiculous, right? They, they, they can't even get their minds wrapped around that, that thought process, buying just because the stock's going up. But this is what Wall Street preaches, right? And what I also found was, Wall Street had no conviction most of the time. Most of the time, these folks just followed each other around. And if the belief was all in on a stock, they were all in. And if the belief was all out on a stock, they were all out. There was no conviction there. They were just kind of following each other around and whatever the trend was is whatever they went for, right? It's no different than, you know, you have certain people that dress in, in clothes that are very, um, you know, like they look at whatever, how everybody else is dresses and they want to dress that way. And you have certain people that take some, some risk out there, right? And they have the conviction that like, I'm going to pull this off. And Buffett and Lynch, these guys are all conviction. They, 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 they have the belief. They, they don't care on what happens with their stocks in the short term. If they know a company is thriving and it's going to thrive in the future, they're going to buy that stock regardless of what the stock price says or what the consensus is or the sentiment on the stock or anything like that. They're all conviction. So what I started to gravitate toward was folks like Buffett and Lynch because I realized, oh, my gosh, these are guys that actually put up the numbers. These are actually the Tom Brady's uh, and the Aaron Rodgers and the Peyton Manning's of this game. And this is where things are actually at. And these rest of the guys were just, they're just there. They're just there to, to, to have a job, essentially, kind of like the, the rest of the quarterbacks out there, right? And then in 2011, so I've been in the market a couple years. In 2011, I saw a movie called Limitless. And um, I, there was a line in that movie that I thought was so powerful. And um, in, the, in the movie, essentially, it says, you know, share prices aren't really based on how a company works. It's based upon, um, you know, psychology, right? And I would studied psychology on, on a pretty high level in, in college. And it was something I've always been very fascinated by. And I was already starting to feel like that. And I was like, that's 100% right. Because what I would notice in the stock market time and time again is stocks were either got to levels that were incredibly undervalued or incredibly overvalued. And this happened consistently. And so I started to look at this and I'm like, why is this happening? It doesn't make any sense. Like stocks should be in theory, usually fairly valued, but almost never are stocks fairly valued. Most of the time, these stocks are either overvalued or undervalued. And I'm like, why is this happening? Right. And then it brought me to something extremely important. And this was something that Ben Graham said in Warren Buffett and, uh, you know, folks like that echoed this over time, Peter Lynch, right? And they say, in the short run, the market is a voting machine. But in the long run, it's a weighing machine. And it so perfectly emphasizes exactly what happens in the stock market, where in the short term, like, everybody is just voting on this thing. And over time, the, what's going on with that company on the long term will matter over time. But in the short run, it doesn't really matter. And if everybody wants to sell off a stock, guess where its stock price is going? Down in a significant way. If everybody wants to buy up a stock, regardless of what goes on with that company's fundamentals, it's going up. We've seen this time and time again in the market. And the, more you, the longer you've been around this game, you're going to see this continually, where regardless of a company's fundamentals, stocks can go up <clears throat> in a dramatic fashion and down in a dramatic fashion, okay? And so all these things started to play out, and I started to understand things on maybe just a little bit deeper. And what you're going to notice is on Wall Street, they have all these written rules and unwritten rules, and such as the one I'm showing you in front of you right now, which is called the three-day rule in, in regards to stocks. In short, the three-day rule dictates the fo that following a substantial drop in a stock share price, typically high single digits or more in terms of percentage change, investors should wait three days to buy. So Wall Street has all these things. Like, it, it, does that make any sense? Not really. Like, at the end of the day, if you feel like an asset's extremely undervalued, you should buy it, regardless if it just went down yesterday or the day before. But at the same time, if everybody believes that, then it starts to become a truth, right? So if I could get everybody to believe that you don't buy bread and we don't eat bread in the month of May, and if I could get everybody to believe that, guess what? Bread sales are going to go to zero in the month of May because everybody's of the belief that we should not buy bread in the month of May. We don't eat bread in the month of May, right? And so 
In this situation, Wall Street has convinced everybody that there's a, this three-day rule, and so don't even think about buying a stock if it goes down. And what happens is it starts to become a truth, right? No different than a lot of the technical indicators with stocks. These are not the truths, but they become the truths over time because people start to give them value. And if everybody is of the belief that if this stock hits a 200-day moving average, you, you know, you got to buy it or you got to sell it, and everybody's of that same exact belief, then it starts to become like a truth, right? Even though it shouldn't be, it starts to become that. No different than the three-day rule. That should not be a thing. But because it's so put out there all the time and everybody starts to believe in it, guess what happens? <laughs> for the three days after a stock falls, usually it's not coming back for that, that three-day period. And it starts to come back on the fourth day, fifth day, and so on and so forth from there. Right? And so these things that Wall Street puts out there, they start to become truths. And they really shouldn't be, to be quite frank. Okay? Meta stock. This stock is now 72.4% year to date. It's trading at a $250 billion market capitalization now at this point in time, which is absolutely laughable. I want to go through some actual truths with you in regards to Meta because there's a lot of there's a lot of fairy tales told around the stock that aren't truths. And so I said, let's just go through actual truth facts and they'll go from there okay so if you're talking about who's running the world in terms of who's got the most users who runs the internet it is a company called meta they control the three most popular platforms out there with obviously fb having around three billion monthly active users these numbers are all higher pretty much now than they were at january uh, whatsapp has over two billion monthly active users and instagram has about 1.5 billion monthly active users the three of the most popular you know uh, apps and websites whatever you want to call it in the world you're going to ever find right and so they have this they have a customer base like no one else has in the world there's a lot of other co companies that have massive customer bases google comes to mind apple comes to mind you know companies like amazon come to mind walmart comes to mind but there's one company that dominates them all and it's the one you're looking at in front of you right there in meta and that's a fact that's not it can't be debated meta's market cap now isn't even in the top 20 most valuable companies in the world which is almost laughable at this point in time that they have put this company into a situation where it's they've just completely thrown it out of the most valuable companies in the world even though they have a customer base that no one else has in the world and by a large margin it's just been completely thrown out remember what i told you earlier about voting machine versus weighing machine right so the metaverse everybody says metaverse you know it's 10 years away right well, what if we just look at last year and we say, how, how, did, how did Oculus do last year? Did you know Oculus sold as many devices as Xbox did last year? Did you know it's actually getting to comparable numbers with something like PlayStation? And never mind, the Oculus 3 should be coming out in 2023. I'm sure that's going to be a record breaker for the company in a huge scale moment and a point in time where maybe they surpass even things like PlayStation and Nintendo and when Oculus 3 comes out in 2023, right? And so this is a this is something that we're told is 10 years away, but yet it's already starting to reach some pretty impressive numbers when you just look at the facts and the data behind this, right? It's incredible. That's really, really incredible. And imagine where things will be in three years from now. Imagine five years from now, seven years from now, 10 years from now, right? Did you know the Quest Store just surpassed $1.5 billion in content revenue? Hmm. You know, once again, this is something we're, we're told is 10 years away. And when you look at the data behind this, it's like, I think this is, this is going to happen more like in a three to five year frame, more than the 10 years away frame. Look at the numbers that are already starting to build here, right? Another fact for you, Meta stock price is back to the same level it was in 2015. Here's some numbers for you. In 2015, Meta did $17 billion of revenue. In 2022, Meta should do roughly $117 billion in revenue. $117 billion. We'll see where that shakes out. It could be 116, could be 118, 119, something like that. But around 107. Think about that for a moment. And the stock is valued at the same it was when it was generating $17 billion of revenue. It's laughable. The valuation of this company is laughable. Now, at this point in time, incredible, okay? Now, what I'm showing you in front of you is extremely important because this is what everybody on Wall Street's caught up into right now, capital expenditures. This company has spent year-to-date 
over almost $23 billion in capital expenditures, CapEx, okay? And by the end of the year, probably be, you know, well over $25 billion, if not $27 billion, somewhere around there, okay? So that's how much the company spent, you know, maybe even approaching $30 billion. We'll see where it shakes out by the end of the year. But that's what Wall Street's so caught up into. They see the company spending, like, insane, and they're like, you are wrong, Meta. Th that's what Wall Street's saying. Not Meta. They're telling Zuckerberg, you're wrong, Zuckerberg. We know better than you. You should not be spending all this money. You should be spending maybe $10 billion on CapEx and throwing off the rest of that money to share buybacks and throwing off the rest maybe in dividends or just building up the company's war chest of money or something like that rather than spending this aggressively, right? And this is not the first time or the last time Zuckerberg will have been doubted. You remember when they bought Instagram for a billion dollars? Which, by the way, if Instagram was a standalone company, would probably be valued at $100 billion plus here today. But... There's a lot of people said that that was a bubble. It was ridiculous. That was silly. And Facebook just has too much money, so they're throwing a billion dollars at this Instagram thing, right? And obviously, we know how that played out over time, right? But this is not the only time Zuckerberg's been doubted. He was obviously doubted when they bought WhatsApp for $19 billion. He was doubted when, when Facebook went public about, oh, this is just going to be the next MySpace. They've been saying that was the, they've been saying Facebook's the next MySpace since way before the company went public. Think about that for a moment. Over 10 years they've been saying that. And what has Facebook done? Continue to grow users, continue to grow every single metric, every single number imaginable over the last 10 plus years, why they said that was going to become irrelevant. So Zuckerberg's a guy that has been doubted time and time and time again. And who won in every single situation? Zuckerberg. The people that doubted him lost again and again and again. So here we are at a pivotal moment again, where once again, people are saying, you're wrong, Zuckerberg, we're right, you don't know what you're doing here, you're going to be wrong on this. Who's going to win the game? I just wonder, okay? Because if we look at the facts and the data, it looks like Zuckerberg's on his way to winning this game as well. And this is a game that's going to be bigger than any of the games he played previously. It's bigger than Facebook, it's bigger than Instagram, it's bigger than WhatsApp. It's bigger than any opportunity we've ever seen in human history from a financial perspective and from a societal perspective. So I wonder, I just wonder who's going to win this situation. It's not the first time he's been doubted and won't be the last either, to be quite frank, right? Now, also when it comes to Meta, it's a company with $178 billion in assets and $54 billion in total liabilities. And they could, this number should be a lot bigger because their goodwill, in my opinion, is actually way, way, way bigger than that number. But regardless... You know, one of the best balance sheets you'll ever find out there. Absolutely incredible balance sheet at this company, right? And um, there they are. Just, just you know, being treated like it's a penny stock. So I went ahead and bought about $77,000. Uh, $77, I was talking so many billions, I was about to say $77 billion. Uh, about $77,000 of stock. I bought 650 shares here a day. At 93.12, I bought another 177 shares in my Ally account at $16,533 uh, $16, worth there for about a $77,000 move roughly for Meta. Now, one of the, the questions might be, like, why so heavy in Meta here today, right? Like, well, first off, this is likely not my last time I'm buying Meta. I'm going to likely continue to buy Meta for at least the next six months, if not 12 months. So this is not like this is my last time buying. Now, we specifically bought extra heavy today. And the reason I bought extra heavy today is, one, we've just been through a massive capitulation. It feels like throw everything, throw the kitchen sink at it type quarter in which the stock sold off to incredible levels, which is a similar thing that happened in Netflix back around May when Netflix traded down to about 170 bucks, roughly somewhere in there, 170 180 dollars. And uh, you kind of threw the kitchen sink at that, that company. And I think Meta is in a very similar situation where they threw the kitchen sink. And although it could go lower... I don't want to bank on that. I kind of hope it goes lower secretly because, I, like I said, I'm not done buying the stock for another 6, 12 months. So the cheaper you can give me shares, the better off I'm going to be, right? But I, I have my doubts about this stock going much lower. Also, we just are about to get over the three-day rule now. So the company reported Wednesday after the bell. So that means Thursday, Wall Street couldn't buy it. Friday, Wall Street couldn't buy it. And today, Monday, Wall Street couldn't buy it. So now... The three-day rule's over, so over Tuesday and the rest of this week, I would not be surprised if that stock starts to come back quite strong, unless the whole market collapses. If the whole market crashes for the rest of this week, obviously Meta will get pulled down more with all the other stocks out there. But 
assuming the market's just decent, like like break even for the rest of this week, or especially if it goes up, I wouldn't be surprised at all if Meta stock actually climbs significantly for the rest of this week and, and kind of goes from here essentially. So that's the way I look at Meta. That's why I went so dang heavy today. Um, but regardless, I'm not done buying the stock. I'm not going to be done for a while uh, in regards to this one. I want to build this into certainly a top three position. It's top after today's move, it should be top five position. Um, I want to build it in a top three. And I'll probably take it to number one. Not because I'm planning on, on selling any of the other massive positions I have, whether it be Tesla or the Chef or Honest or, or any of those, right? But just from the standpoint of, um, you know, I'm just going to continue to plow money in that one and um, it's not going to stop anytime soon. So, yeah. Big move for me here today, guys. Hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you got some value out of it. Regardless, if you like this stock uh, or don't like this stock, I hope you got some good value out of this, stock, of this video and kind of me storytelling about a bit of my journey there and uh, kind of the way I view all these things in regards to Wall Street and, and all those sorts of things. So much love as always. I appreciate you guys. Make sure you check out that Moo Moo deal before it ends to get up to 15 free stocks valued up to $2,000 with the pinned comment down there. Much love and have a great day.